city government. Say goodbye to your desk. And get your info in your space on your time. And now you can explore parks, public art, learn about events, transportation options, and community centers right from your mobile device. Your connection, your Orlando. The new city of Orlando.net, your official home of the city beautiful. situation we have in the, in, the, in the nation for that matter, uh, they have seen themselves short of being able to provide for the families. So what we're doing is helping people, incentivizing and motivating people also by doing this. This is a community effort. We know your workspace isn't always at a desk, so break free with the new city of Orlando.net. Our new site lets you experience your city government wherever your desk may be on your own time. So now you can access permitting services, participate in online forums, and check code enforcement statuses right from your mobile devices. Your connection, your Orlando. The new city of Orlando.net your official home of the city beautiful. The Office of Communications and Neighborhood Relations now offers the iLEAD series, your interactive neighborhood training source. iLEAD is a series of guides, videos, webinars, and workshops created for our neighborhood leaders. Topics range from effectively holding meetings to utilizing community tools and engaging the next generation of leaders. iLEAD is a comprehensive program that provides you with the tools to inform, connect, and involve your neighbors. iLEAD downloadable guides provide in-depth information and tools for finding success in your association. iLead Videos offers quick tips and best practices in two-minute segments. iLead Webinars provide a platform for neighborhood leaders to connect online and participate in interactive group meetings. And iLead Workshops include customized training at association meetings, monthly community connection workshops, and my yearly neighborhood and community summit. The iLead series is your interactive neighborhood training source. For more information, visit cityoforlando.net backslash I lead.
welcome to your new home. Several years ago, we uh, had a developer that was considering putting a building, how many stories, Mr. Sheehan, about 12, 13, 17 stories right here. There were uh, four or five houses, and we had the opportunity by working with the Trust for Public Land to purchase 1.3 acres and add it to Lake Eola, and it has become this beautiful lawn um, that so many people have already had the opportunity to enjoy. And we purchased the five houses, but we kept the very best one, and we turned it into a brand new welcome center. This wonderful, wonderful new facility where we can have, you know, retreat space, convention space, not big conventions, of course, but if people want to get away and have a small, con you know, have a small retreat or something like that, it's absolutely breathtaking. And also, I thank the historic preservation officer because he actually picked the colors and made this, this, um, this really pop, and we're working to put some more history in here and celebrate this area because it's so historic. It's part of our old downtown, and uh, I think you all are really, really going to enjoy this. You're a person on the go, which means you can't be tied down to a computer. Stay on track with the new city of Orlando.net and get access to your government on your time, wherever your destination may be. Now you can explore entertainment options, stay connected with city council, and track downtown development right from your mobile device. Your connection, your Orlando. The new city of Orlando.net, your official home of the city beautiful. It was unbelievable the fan support we had that night. I know for a fact the guys just absolutely fed off that. It was it was huge having 21,000 supporters. You know, we get the start of the game and I looked up and I got chills looking at all those people. It was just a wall of people. You know, from a coach's standpoint, I know Adrian and I were were just amazed by the passion, the, how many fans were out there, obviously, but but the passion of those fans, uh, how loud they were. And we're just so proud and so pleased that we were we were to bring a championship home for them. It just shows everybody the potential that we have here to, to become an MLS club. The redesigned cityoforlando.net is a new way to experience your city government. Say goodbye to your desk. And get your info in your space on your time. And now you can explore parks, public art, learn about events, transportation options, and community centers right from your mobile device. Your connection, your Orlando. The new cityoforlando.net, your official home of the city beautiful.
Welcome to Rosemont Park on Cinder Lane, our newest park in the city of Orlando. We opened it up just in time for the school to start. And I want you to look behind me and look at the great stuff we have. This is a park that's designed just for two to five year olds, a chance for those preschool kids to have come down here, use up some of their energy and play in our community. We have a, a lot of uh, housing here that is multifamily housing, lots of kids in the area and really no place to play. There's so, there's so little space, it's not even a parking lot here. So this is a walk-through park. There's a, a shade cover here. People that sit and watch their kids. And, um, and it's just a nice, good, clean, quaint little park for the kids. And all they have it for ages uh, two to five. It's a great thing because they don't have anywhere to go otherwise. Uh, but that's the larger kids that um, pretty much take over the park at Rosemont Community Center. So for this year, for the community, I want to thank the Parks Department and all those people involved, especially the kids from Rosemont. Today we did the green up around here and added plants and added mulch. It's just now a community effort, and so we're really thrilled about that. So come down, come to Rosemont Park, and enjoy it. on the tracks. Whoa, did you see that squirrel? We know your workspace isn't always at a desk. So break free with the new city of Orlando.net. Our new site lets you experience your city government wherever your desk may be on your own time. So now you can access permitting services, participate in online forums, and check code enforcement statuses right from your mobile devices. Your connection, your Orlando. The new city of Orlando.net, your official home of the city beautiful. The city of Orlando has come a long way. Orlando has certainly changed over the past several decades, and it's grown in leaps and bounds from what it used to be. The growth of both business and population has brought the potential for wasting our natural resources. It's time to look to the future. What can the city of Orlando do to become a greener, more energy efficient community? How much different will the city look in the year 2040? Good morning, I'm Mayor Buddy Dyer, and I would like to welcome you to the April 14, 2014 workshop of the Orlando City Council. And this morning, um, we're going to have the first of what I anticipate are a series of budget work sessions as we lead up to fiscal year 14-15. Over the last few years, we've talked about the impact of the economic recession and state-imposed revenue caps on our budget. And as a council, we have made conscious decisions to preserve core services like police and fire while reducing the size of our government and other areas over the last several years. Initially, we've made prudent financial decisions that have kept our reserve fund filled. 
paid our pension obligations rather than putting those off and kept our bond ratings high. Welcome, Commissioner Ortiz. Commissioners, I know that most of the information we're going to see this morning isn't new to you, but I think it's important that we look at where we have come from the last several years as a starting point for these discussions. So, Rebecca, you're on. Thank you very much, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, as the Mayor indicated, this is the first in a, a session, a series of sessions, where we were, will explore uh, the 2015 budget. We're starting earlier this year than we have, and the reason for that is that we are foreseeing that there will have to be more decisions made this year. We want to give plenty of time for each of the commissioners to get their questions answered, to have any research done that they wish to do, and, and that is why we're starting this uh, quite a bit earlier than we've done in, in, in previous years. Today we want to uh, basically look at our fiscal year 2014 budget and review that. Um, we also want to highlight uh, some of the city's initiatives and the impact or not uh, uh, impact that those particular projects have on our general fund. Uh, I think there's a lot of confusion out there. This part of the presentation is designed uh, to try to uh, eliminate some of that conf confusion. We also want to discuss some of the revenue implications for developing the budget for this next year, as well as revisit some of the actions that the Mayor and Council have taken to manage within our revenue constraints and the impact that those decisions have on our future budgets. And then finally, we'll talk about our going forward uh, activities, kind of how we see this playing out in the next uh, four months or so, and uh, kind of get you uh, uh, engaged uh, so that uh, we can come see you when you need information or uh, if you want us to do research or provide you uh, with any materials that will assist you in making the decisions that are ahead of you. Looking back on our 2014 approved budget, we can be reminded what makes up that 934 roughly million dollars. And you can see that the general fund is about 38 percent of that total. We have uh, a number of other funds here um, and, and the, the general fund budget is $357 million of that $934 uh, million. Uh, it's interesting to note that the city maintains and manages over 60 separate and distinct funds in the city. The segregation of funds that we talk about uh, is, is in the city. It can really, I like to compare it to a strip center or a shopping center, and that is that, you know, there are many stores in a shopping center. They're separate businesses. Uh, we have bigger stores such as the Anchors, and we have smaller stores uh, in, that, in that strip center. Each store is a separate business, and it operates independently of the others, although they may share certain services such as a parking lot, security, trash pickup, those kinds of things. They are separate businesses. Each store is on its own to determine its profitability and financial health. And the assets and liabilities of the stores are not commingled. Uh, if one pursues a new initiative, the others are not directly involved in it. And that's how certain initiatives can move forward without involving the general fund. We're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail in just a minute. But in 2014, we proposed no tax increase or millage increase. Um, and it remained, the millage remained at $5.65 per $1,000 of value. Uh, and we used the historical underspend. We essentially every year, uh, you know, budget for our, our full year funding for all of our operations and our service levels. And then what happens is our managers are encouraged to underspend that budget to only spend when it's necessary to spend. There's some natural underspending that occurs because when an individual leaves the city, it's not always that the very next day someone gets hired into that position. And so as a result, the funding for some positions that become vacant uh, may be underspent in the year. Um, but there's also some things that our department directors have routinely done. And this has really been a sea change in uh, the, the culture of this organization, and that is that they are very uh, frugal about their spending and are happy to return uh, unspent revenues at the end of the year by creating efficiencies 
uh, by being very, uh, very frugal and, and, and very deliberate about spending lines, uh, budget lines such as supplies and services, and as I indicated before, managing employee vacancies uh, as well. Uh, the, the, the unspent prior year revenue that results from this underspending for 2012 and 2013 were used to fund 2014's budget uh, in part. Uh, and then additionally, we, had, we created uh, essentially the, two, the equivalent of the 2014 anticipated underspend by cutting their budgets by what we would anticipate that they would underspend. Now, once again, these types of uh, techniques, uh, you know, can only be used if they are available to us. And I showed you this slide last, uh, last year, only uh, the right bucket had water in it. And you'll note this year it doesn't. Our uh, reserve bucket is full, uh, but that is a one-time source. Uh, and we, are, we try to keep that, bu that bucket full. What does that bucket do for us? Well, if we have shortfalls in revenues that we don't anticipate, then, then you know, that bucket can help fill that so that we uh, are not short of money and we don't have a, a problem delivering the services that we committed to to our, uh, to our citizens. Um, but in addition, the, um, that can be used for, for emergencies, such as hurricanes and, and other kinds of, of things, un unanticipated events that require us to spend more than we would expect. And so as a result, uh, it's important to keep that particular bucket as full as possible. Now last year, after filling our reserves to a maximum level, we had some water in the right bucket, as I said before. This coming year, there is no water in that bucket. So there are no accumulated prior year unspent revenues. Why is that? Because we used 2012s, 2013s, and then we anticipated 2014s to balance the budget in 2014. <clears throat> Let's take a, a, a look just before we move on to some specific numbers in the general fund. Uh, to look at City of Orlando initiatives, I know that there's a lot of, of feeling out there on the part of uh, interested parties and citizens uh, that perhaps some of these initiatives has, have caused the, the, the revenue shortfalls that we're experiencing. And in fact, they, they get confused with all the governmental accounting, which obviously uh, uh, I would never expect for them to, to even be interested in, much less uh, take the time to learn. But it does require segregation of funds. It requires for essentially these funds to be walled off so that, so that the assets and liabilities in each one of those funds and the financial position is distinct and discreet from other funds that we have in the city. And most of the initiatives over the last 10 years have had little or no impact on the general fund. And I'm going to go through those and explain what general fund impact there's been so that we can be very, very clear that those initiatives have not caused this problem. Let's first take SunRail. SunRail has required capital investment. Uh, and more specifically, the stations, the four stations, train stations, within the city limits of the city of Orlando, have had to be built by the local government. We borrowed money from the state infrastructure uh, fund, uh, or uh, bank, I think, the state infrastructure bank, the, the CID, to build these stations, and they'll be repaid uh, during the period that the state is paying for operations of the train. So we will be paying that in, in, over a, a certain period of time while the city is operating the train. We pay that debt off and then operations take over beyond that. So that is essentially the financial plan that we had. Will we know specifically what the, that operational requirement is? No, but we estimate based on the other estimates that have been done with regard to operating the train, that this will be in the ballpark. Um, we expect for uh, the, the uh, amount that we're going to need for that, we're going to know it a few years in advance, so we can do some planning for that. But we anticipate that it's pretty much going to be a continuation of the amount that we paid and have paid over the last few years uh, for that SIB loan. Medical City. Back in 2006, the city, the county, Lake Nona Land, and the Burnham Institute at La Jolla 
California entered into an agreement that called for the building of an institute building in Lake Nona. The city's contribution to this project was about $34 million, all of which was funded from unspent revenues at the end of 2006 and 2007. So it was never a budgeted item within a fiscal year, but rather using unspent revenues at the end of the year for 2006 and 2007. And this was before the 2009 recession, by the way. No future expenditures are expected for this project. And as you know, uh, now the Sanford Burnham Institute is uh, um, up and running and, and has been for a number of years. Orlando Venues, another one that many people believe that their property tax is somehow paying for uh, the venues or, or other general fund money has been used to create the venues. However, this is not the case. All construction funds and costs of the venues have been paid by sources outside of the city or by sources in the city but outside the general fund and more specifically uh, the CRA. <clears throat> the only general fund revenue that is even related uh, to Orlando venues is an amount that we budget each year, a $1 million amount that offsets the reduced rates that community events are provided as well as free parking and reduced rate parking that's provided for uh, disabled uh, patrons as well as uh, some uh, discounted parking and free parking at some of these community events. And by the way, these, these rates have been mandated by the City Council, so you've had the decision making uh, over making sure that those uh, community events are accommodated at a price that they can afford. Others have been confused that the incentive programs which have supported new downtown development has been provided by the general fund. However, these incentives have come from the Community Redevelopment Agency, or CRA, and in every case, in every case, new taxes that are generated by the development, the specific development that gets the incentive, far exceeds the incentive, the incentives that are provided. With those incentives being only 35% of the total tax generated and sometimes even less. And because these developments provide needed infrastructure in public places, they're benefiting the city and the city residents with no investment of the general fund. Another project that's been confusing for some is the Creative Village. The site of the Amway Arena, formerly centri former Centriplex, and a host of surface parking lots were envisioned to be redeveloped into a new transit-oriented urban infill neighborhood to house high-tech, digital media, and creative companies, along with higher education providers and a population of students, employees, and residents living and working together. Through the agreement with the city, uh, or through the agreement the city has made with the Creative Village Development LLC, the land is to be sold for at least $90 million, with all costs to be borne by the Creative Village LLC or the purchasers of the property and that the city has set aside a million dollars from prior year unspent revenues uh, in addition, uh, in, in, in the case that uh, we may need to provide additional infrastructure, there may be obligations that we have. We don't want to be drawing on uh, general fund in an emergency for anything that might come up there, but uh, virtually none of this million dollars has been spent today. The next is the Blueprint Initiative. This is an initiative that really has, has accomplished a great deal, particularly uh, with our minority uh, and women-owned businesses and the small businesses that we have here in Orlando. And this uh, program was designed to be sure that uh, those venues had significant benefit uh, for the individuals who lived in the areas surrounding the venues and that minority business opportunity was enhanced as a result of having those building uh, programs. Uh, no general fund dollars were spent on this, but the, but the impact has been dramatic. And I know that, uh, commissioners, you've seen individuals who have come in and said that their business uh, was saved as a result of having the blueprint and the venues and the, the ability to, to, to do some of the work on those projects. If we just add up the actual impact 
We had a $1.3 million annual impact for SunRail uh, to the general uh, fund, and we have a $1 million annual impact for our community use of the, the Orlando venues assets. That totals $2.3 million annually, and that is just slightly over a half a percent of the general fund. So uh, these projects have not had a significant impact, if an impact at all, and is not the source of uh, the difficulties that we have uh, with regard to this next year's budget. We have employed sound financial practices all along, and I want to, to express my personal thanks to this council uh, and this administration for holding fast to good financial practices. It enables us, in many cases, to do uh, things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And I think that uh, we are well thought of in the financial community because of the decisions that you have made. Uh, decisions such as funding our, budget, our uh, pensions every year at the uh, annually required uh, um, amounts, uh, that we are very conservative in our pension assumptions so that the pension uh, doesn't, the, the, the vagaries, if you will, of uh, markets don't end up causing our pensions to be vastly underfunded. Uh, we uh, have had really good results from the perspective of maintaining a high level of funding in those pensions as a result of that. Uh, we've continued as well to identify other cost saving measures through this time. Uh, we have identified grant opportunities. Uh, we have, have really made a difference, and I'll show you specifically in a moment, uh, in, in going after grants much more so than we did before the economic downturn. Our accomplishments in financial management have been recognized, and specifically lately, by uh, the, the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, when they did an evaluation of cities across the nation and their financial health, and we were lauded as having made excellent decisions in placing ourselves in a position where we were not significantly damaged as other cities were in the economic downturn. Public safety is job one. It's our first priority. And I think that if you look at our numbers from 2002 to now, you can see the growth of public safety expenses while the rest of government has shrunk. Uh, we've gone from 38% of our general fund budget to 55% of our general fund budget is public safety. And I think even more uh, a direct indication of that is that our direct public safety expenses increased by $89.8 million and the general fund budget as in, in total only increased $71 million, and, and that basically uh, means that $18.8 .8 million less is being spent in the non-public safety areas of our budget today than was spent in 2002. Part of the reason why we've been able to do some of that is that we have really leveraged grants since the economic downturn, and you can see by this graph that the last four budget years we have used grants to uh, a, a, a great amount. However, these grant sources are drying up. There will not be as much available to us to even apply for, much less receive in the future. And that then means that those services that are, are or projects that are funded by grants will have to be funded by other areas or we'll have to uh, um, eliminate them. Well, let's look at some of the revenue constraints that we have and some of the prior year budget actions that we've done. I think one of our major problems now in cities across Florida is that property tax revenue just has not kept up with inflation. And I think that uh, when we look back to property tax reform, that, was, that property tax reform was done at the height of the market and immediately we had a real estate, a severe real estate downturn. And so as a result, those revenues uh, immediately fell off. And, and I think you can see that in the 2007, 8, and, and 9, uh, we were not able to keep up with inflation and haven't kept up with inflation since because of uh, the additional caps that were in, uh, put into place in 2010 and 11. And, and you can see there that, that in the last four years, our property tax has not grown significantly. Uh, that is because of two things. Uh, the first is that property values have not grown significantly. 
Uh, but if they did, the caps that are in place keep us from being able to get the benefit of any kind of growth that would help us to recover to the levels that we had uh, back in 2009. And so as a result, even new construction, you can see new construction is the uh, mustard color uh, part of the bar. And we're getting new construction, but the new construction is really not having an impact, uh, a significant impact on where we are uh, with regard to that, uh, uh, to that revenue stream. If we just go and look at the specifics of property tax reform, uh, in 2014 we had over $7 million of taxes that were not provided because of the caps in place, just specifically the 10% uh, commercial cap and the 3% save our homes cap, and then other homestead uh, uh, items as well, uh, the doubling of the homestead exemption, portability, all of those various things. So I think, uh, you know, if you look over the, the uh, five years since 2010, you can see that, that there's been about $29 million that we've lost in taxes as a result of these caps. And so uh, it's, it's caused uh, part of our hole uh, that has been created. Well, there's good news and bad news with sales tax. The good news is that it's kind of kept up with inflation. The bad news is it's too small to make much of a difference. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that, you know, this one has recovered, and we've seen it recover, and obviously it's recovered because of the uh, activities that we can watch uh, happening in Tallahassee. Another revenue that hasn't kept up with inflation for us is our OUC dividend. And as you can see here, the OUC dividend has pretty much languished uh, around the mid-40s uh, over this period, uh, and that's probably about $8 million dollars behind uh, where it should be with regard to inflation. We have also uh, done a number of budget reductions, really reductions every year uh, during the period since 2009, since the economic downturn. There have been reductions that have been put in the budget, and these reductions have not been removed uh, to a large extent. There have been some things that have been restored, such as uh, a few cycles of mowing, for instance, our Main Street program was, was put back. Our uh, Christmas decorations, to an extent, uh, was placed uh, back into the budget. But generally speaking, these things have not been, been replaced. And, and the impact of that in 2014 was that our budget was $41 million less than it would have been had those particular items remained in the budget. And cumulatively, over the period from 2009 through 14, the amount of money that has uh, not gotten into the budget as a result of these cuts is $123 million, uh, quite a sizable chunk of change. What were some of these, um, these reductions that have basically survived the last six years? Well, I've listed them by the date that they were uh, established. Uh, in 2009, holiday bonuses, uh, parks and uh, family parks and recreation, landscaping, business incentives in 10. Uh, we reduced a number of our technology contracts. Um, we reduced o overtime and lineup pay and OPD and public works, reduced equipment and landscaping. Um, code, uh, code enforcement board up services uh, were curtailed. Uh, FPR mowing pool hours and athletic supplies were reduced. Community organization funding was reduced. OFD ve vehicles and special teams pay were reduced as well. In 2011, we extended our fleet replacement so that we did not have to uh, replace uh, vehicles as often, and we were hold on, holding on to them for a longer period. Uh, we reduced our CIP contribution, and this directly affected our parks and our streets uh, re uh, re replacement and maintenance funds. We had an OPD attrition number of $1.8 million uh, then. Um, and then in 12, we had a risk premium rebate of $3 million. Uh, and then uh, the self-insured health uh, funding, uh, going to that self-insured program, saved us $4.5 million and has continued to do so since. Uh, and then in 13, we've just added, and 14, additional attrition. And so those sa all of those savings have accumulated to that $123 million number. 
When we look at expenses and cutting expenses, there's a couple of things that I want to set out here before we start at our next um, workshop to talk about solutions here. And that is what we're able to, to deal with and what we're not able to deal with and what the impacts of, of uh, reducing expenditures might be. A significant amount of our budget is non-discretionary. What, what things are non-discretionary? Well, we have to make the transfer of taxes from the general fund as increment revenues into our CRAs. Uh, that's not optional. <laughs> we have to do that each year. Uh, we also have to pay debt on police stations, fire stations, and parks, which is in our general fund. We also cannot cut certain expenditures that have offsetting revenues, because if we cut the expenditures, we don't get the revenues that are associated with them. And that next uh, light blue uh, column there is uh, essentially revenue-supported spending. So if you cut the spending, you cut the revenue. There's no impact on the general fund for, for cutting those particular expenses. Then you see our police, our fire, our FPR, our public works, and our economic development organization. Um, and these are net of revenues, so you'll note that um, you know, the, the revenues that these functions produce have been netted off, and this is the relationship that you'll see there. And any, of the, any cuts in that particular area of the budget will, redu will result in service level impacts. We can't cut in those areas because of the cuts that we made before without impacting service levels, and so that's really the trade-off. An, an impact to those particular areas will have a negative impact on our service delivery capability. And then finally, the executive offices in my office are uh, there at the end. Um, we are essentially support everything else that you see there. And, but to, to a large extent, our operations uh, you know, are overhead. And, and so there, are, there is less of an impact on service levels when those are cut than uh, when the others are. When we start looking at alternatives, which we will in our next budget workshop on the 28th of April, there are really, we're taught in, in school, we're taught in budgeting school, uh, that there are really four different ways to balance a budget. The first is to increase revenue. Um, obviously, there are certain opportunities we have as cities. There are, uh, is actually a fairly limited list of, of revenues that we can raise. Uh, in cities, and we will be reviewing those. We can reduce services, as I indicated before, looking at various programs that we no longer want to maintain. That would give us an opportunity to reduce some of our expenses. Another technique is to transfer responsibilities to another entity. And uh, in a lot of cases, this is very difficult to do. Um, Un unless, you know, there is some kind of hierarchical situation of obviously we've experienced a lot of that coming from the state and some of the unfunded mandates that we've had, but nevertheless that is one technique that can be used uh, to balance the budget. And then the final, and not really my favorite, is to defer certain things to future years. I think it's fine if we're deferring a program to future years, deferring other kinds of things which won't really create uh, any benefit to the budget, such as deferring pensions or anything like that, uh, not, not, on, not high on my list as your CFO uh, to recommend those kinds of things. But we will explore everything. Everything will be on the table uh, so that any ideas that you may have, if you'll let me know, uh, we'll add them uh, to the workshop on the 28th. And, uh, you know, we will, we will explore all of them so that you have uh, the ability uh, to evaluate all of them and make your decision. So going forward, uh, the key dates that we have, uh, obviously today, but also on the 28th, as I indicated, we're going to do another workshop that will look at the alternatives that we have to fill the anticipated gap that we have. Now, in terms of the numbers associated with that gap, we don't yet have all of the information that we need to know what that number is. First of all, we don't have a tax roll, and we don't really know whether we have significant uh, new, new construction that might help. Uh, or, or additional values and the growth of values during that period. And we won't get that information until May the 30th. And at that particular point, that's a best estimate. Generally, that is a low estimate, or it has traditionally been. Uh, and so, you know, the um, June 19th, the, the preliminary tax roll, is really where we know what number we're dealing with, and we can really zero 
in on a very specific dollar amount that, that's needed uh, and then craft our solution. And during the July and August time frames, we'll be in the crafting of the solution business. Uh, we do have to adopt our pre preliminary, preliminary millage rate on the 28th of July uh, because the trim notices have to be mailed based on that preliminary rate. Uh, on August 14th, and then our budget hearings will be on or after September 3rd. There are statutes that indicate how, what the time frame is uh, with regard to those uh, budget hearings, but it cannot be before the 3rd, and we're working with the mayor's office to establish those dates uh, as we speak. And then, of course, the first of the fiscal year begins on October 1st. So with that, thank you for your attention, and Mayor, I'll <coughs> answer any questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Council, we're starting this out pretty early so that we have an, op <coughs> an opportunity to make wise financial decisions, and this is, I know this probably was the exact presentation or close to it that we had last year, except last year we had unspent revenue that was left over from the prior operating year and even the year before that that we don't have the balanced budget with. So um, it was the good fiscal management of our departments that left us in a situation where we had money left over over and above the 25 percent reserve policy. So we don't have that this year. And we also in the last several years had big federal grants in police, cops grant and in fire safer grant that have run their course. So we're facing the reality of what um, our revenue picture is going to be like for uh, the foreseeable future. And I would like to try to get us to a spot where we are sustainable year to year. I don't know exactly what that means, but um, I certainly don't want to be in a situation where we're thinking about using reserves every year because when you start using your reserves, that's a one-time use and it's going to be much harder to build reserves up. Uh, in the future than it has been in the past as well. So that's the beginning point, and I'll recognize Commissioner Stewart and then Commissioner Gray. Um, thank you, Mayor, and, and I agree with you. We've, we've kind of heard this um, train coming for a couple of years when we began to see all the uh, issues that with the statewide and restricting revenue stream. A um, couple of quick questions, and I've got some offline I'll give, cover with you later on. but. Um, uh, ad valorem tax continues to go down effectively because the values go down and we can't match that, build that back up based upon your chart in, in any new construction that we can anticipate. Um, you, what, tell us briefly, based upon what our best estimate is now, um, what's the impact of increase in the millage rate in terms of revenue to the general revenue? Um, and I'll just use last year's tax rule. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's going to be a diff it's going to be different one way or another. It won't be the same. But using last year's tax rule, um, one dollar on the tax rate raised seventeen million dollars. So, so you can take that ten cents raises one point seven million dollars. Yeah. A penny raises one hundred and seventy thousand. The point five six five now goes to point six six five raises seventeen million. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right, um, next question. Uh, on page 10, you talked about the, the, the um, SunRail reimbursement, and, um, and I was trying to follow along with you and listen and read at the same time, and that's, I have a hard time doing that. Um, but um, we roughly are looking at about a $1.3 million that we are paying now for the first seven years that's going into construction of the infrastructure that we have, and then we anticipate that same about 1.3 million may be beyond the seven years in terms of operational support. Is that what you're telling me? That's yes, 1.3 million fact, there? In fact, we had an opportunity to pay the, uh, I believe we had an opportunity to pay the SIB loan back over a longer period, but we thought it was prudent to pay it while we weren't paying the operations and nest that operation behind it. So, you know, we had, I, I think it was seven years. Right. of payment on the SIB loan. We amortized that over seven years so that we kind of had a placeholder here for the operations beyond that. Now, we think that's fairly close. We've done what we can to determine what those are, but, but obviously um, it's not a perfect science seven years in advance, and yeah. we will watch that. And as I indicated, we should know in a, you know several years in advance that 
that number will either be larger or smaller by looking at the operations of Sunrail. Um, contractually, can we, do we have the ability to move gas tax into there, or is all the gas tax basically already ob obligated? All of the gas tax is really obligated. As you know, we spend uh, half of our gas tax to support links. Right. Uh, the, some of our gas tax is paying debt uh, on some of our uh, uh, street projects. Um, and then uh, the rest of the gas tax is used for things like street maintenance and repair uh, and, and various street projects, funding par portions of street projects. <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, transportation grants uh, that require match. Uh, and so usually our match comes from, from gas tax. Uh, I'm sure that uh, our transportation engineers can answer that question much better than I. Uh, if you go much further than that, then I've kind of gotten to the end of my knowledge. Yeah, so. but, we, but we probably generally don't have about $1.3 out of a gas tax to go into mass transit. Yeah, actually, if we did, we would have already done it. The demands on gas tax are larger than the revenue stream yeah. that we yeah. have. Now, the gas tax, again, as a reminder, it's calculated as number of cents per gallon, but not a percentage per of tax, correct? That's it's a correct. fixed dollar. So it's, a, so it's a penny per gallon. I was sharing with a constituent of the day or that he number of pennies per gallon. Yeah, he was mm -hmm. convinced that the higher it goes, <coughs> the more that's good for us. And we kept trying to tell him that it, actually it's counter to that. Mm -hmm. We actually the city wants it to be at about a dollar fifty because we get the same we get the same amount of money per gallon that we get at four dollars, and people use it more, and therefore we have more revenue. So correct. it is a kind of a counterproductive. Um, here's kind of a general question. I'm not sure you can answer the question offhand, and I'm going to jump a little ahead of uh, Commissioner Gray. Um, we, we took $34 million and put it into Burnham, mm -hmm. uh, into the medical city, uh, effectively. And so the real question is, can we estimate what we think in terms of property taxes coming back to us from that same? Um, is there a way to kind of look um, and I'm not sure we can answer it right now, but conceptually, can we look at how we're getting reimbursed on that $34 million? Uh, the $34 million is a good investment, but there's also related to uh, either a, a either development down in Nona or a faster development down in Nona because of it. So uh, we've had the same questions about, um, uh, about uh, Baldwin Park, the investments we made in Baldwin Park, and, and how that investment turns back into being dollars and cents <coughs> to us. So, um, the excuse me. <coughs> um, most of the development that's occurred at Medical City proper uh, is tax exempt, yeah. and and because of that, then there's not really uh, a lot of revenue being generated by Medical City proper. However, because of the things that are in Medical City, there have been a lot of rooftops right. that yeah. have been developed, and a lot and and some commercial that has been developed in the southeast corridor. And so as a result, we do know that there are some, there, there's some, some additional revenue out there. What we, what we haven't been able to do specifically is to identify that. And we're trying to work with the property appraiser to get some understanding of that. I will say, however, that there were some, in, uh, some transportation and park infrastructure commitments that we made that will return some of that increment revenue back to the developer for the, the uh, building, for a portion of the, of the building of the interchange at 417 and Lake Nona Boulevard, and then for a regional park in that area as well. So I, I think that it's good news uh, in that there are some rooftops out there. Actually, it's pretty uh, amazing uh, if, you, if you drive out there to see uh, the amount of development that has occurred. At, as of yet, we don't know numbers on that, but we just know that it's out there. Uh, and we also know that, that you know, there is a point at which we'll have to start returning some of that tax revenue. And then the last question back on page 22, I'll make sure that I'm, I'm on the same page as you. Um, what it appears in 2014 is that it's roughly $7.2 million in, non -re in revenue we did not receive as a result of the property tax reform just for that year alone. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, that does not include anything having to do with the original 3% Save Our Homes. So. That's outside, that's, of that. okay. that's outside of that number. Okay. And so then the, and the, 
you, I think you glossed over it, but I, I just want to make sure it's important. That's 3.6 in as a result of Homestead property tax reform, and then 3.5 roughly in terms of commercial non-Homestead property tax reform. Correct. Only Correct. in the property. Not yeah, the, the Homestead has to do with the additional Homestead exemption, um, and then uh, the portability, uh, the impact of portability. Uh, the uh, Commercial has to do with the ten percent cap, and then there's some, there's some smaller stuff like tangible personal property limits and some things like that. But that's not big numbers. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I'm thank you for your candor, uh, but most importantly, your, your staff's yeoman's work on this type of stuff, and and uh, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for you. So thank you very much, Mr. Gray. Thank you, sir, and thanks, Rebecca. I want to uh, go to page 19, if we could, and kind of follow up on what the mayor um, suggested earlier. Um, this huge increase in grants, a couple of things as we develop this over the coming weeks. Could you help me with what portion of that is for public safety? My sense is a big portion went to public safety, so that's kind of question one. And, and area two to talk about is, of that, how much was for kind of one-time expenditures and how much kind of kick-started some programs that if we can't replace the grant money we're going to have to either I, I guess um, disband that service or figure out another way to fund it so mm -hmm. my sense is we, we've done a great job getting grants but but we've kind of seeded a lot of different programs so mm -hmm. um, as we develop that I'd love to kind of look into that if you could get some detail Okay, we'll be happy Thank to you. do that. I think generally um, our grants kind of come in, for the most part, there are probably some exceptions, but for the most part, three different types of things. One is contri uh, contributions toward capital, mm -hmm. okay? The second is usually programmatic assistance. So there's a program, a grant comes in, it does a part of, of that. Usually there's match, there's other kinds of things that come into play to keep that program going. And usually there's not a lot of grants outside of public, in fact, there's not any grants that I know of outside of public safety that just provide basic services. Uh, but in public safety, we've had the SAFER grant and the COPS grant. We've actually had two SAFER grants, I believe, uh, and two COPS grants during this period uh, that have assisted us in providing essentially plain old, plain Jane, regular services. Uh, and, and those are not, not probably not going to be very plentiful in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, it comes in those three, those three uh, uh, types, and we can get, we'll get breakdowns in those categories for you. I think that will Great. be helpful. And then also probably some, some descriptions of some of the grants, um, you know, kind of what they do, what they've done. I, I think that would be helpful as well. Perfect. Thank you very much. Commissioner Lynham. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, just a few uh, observations, and that is, number one, grants are meant to be soft dollars. <laughs> they aren't meant to hang around forever. But I've been here 16 years, and we've had them for 16 years coming and going one way or the other. So I think I've seen a lot of them come through, and people come in on them fast for the police, overtime for this, or help with the uh, uh, drug interdiction or whatever. So they've really helped offset a lot of our expenses. And, uh, and I think that's a, a, a great thing. But um, this is almost identical <laughs> to last year and the year before. And we sort of preserve the whole thing over and over and over. But um, on the big discussion we had a number of years ago regarding the legislature, we had no control over all of the things that happened in our state legislature and the reduction um, um, in um, or increase in all of these caps and whatnot that affected our, our uh, income. And we had no control over the economic downfall. So I think we probably need to get our arms around just that's the way it is. Now, I've always, I've never had a problem with increasing millage, but we have sort of stood our ground on we didn't want to. I didn't agree with it when we did it in 2002. I still didn't agree with uh, keeping when we reduced it, and we never brought it back up. 
-hmm. and uh, and I, I think reducing, I mean, increasing it 10 cents doesn't make any sense of a dollar, but at least a dollar, if we can get $17 million that will help offset something, I just think uh, that would be a fair and honest thing to do, particularly the way we have managed to keep the millage so low for all this time. And uh, I don't like reduction of services because usually District 5 is the first one to see it and everything, and it's very, very painful. I'd rather pay a dollar more, 50 cents more, whatever, than to see reduction in services. But uh, 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 Commissioner Stewart mentioned the, the gas tax. I'm going to switch over. This region has no dedicated funds for transit. There can be no discussion about our gas taxes going to links. That is one of the most crucial uh, things we do in Orlando and this region is having transit. As a matter of fact, we are increasing it. When you're looking at the SunRail, we're looking at BRTs. The things that we do are important. Gas taxes have always gone to support links. Um, so uh, to me, it's like that's not a topic you even bring up um, until we get designated funds, increases in taxes or something else. And um, so I get real shaky when someone uh, doesn't seem to understand that as a priority for keeping this region uh, mobile and keeping people going to work and not understanding that and where it goes. So uh, I just, just observations to talk about things we do. Um, I am proposing <laughs> and I would support an increase in our millage. It just makes sense to me, but uh, I don't see anyone talking about that gas tax. That is just not an option. We're short already. It makes no sense to even have it as a topic. The other piece, of course, is the 1.3 for SunRail. Everybody knows that the state will help with SunRail for seven years. And we do have an obligation because this is going to be another economic engine for us. You may not be able to see it right away. But it just is. Uh, transportation has never been a money-making uh, uh, um, operation for anybody. <laughs> I mean, since the beginning of subways and highways and whatever else. Um, but I think we have an obligation to, number one, um, increase our millage. How many years has it been that we have not had an increase in millage? A number. I know, 10, whatever. It's been a long time. Because once it was, we reduced it from where it used to be, I think it was 2002, mm -hmm. went down and never even brought it back to where it was mm -hmm. for years. I was, I, I, I know that was one time I did not vote for that reduction. Um, maybe that was the time I was at Harvard, I can't remember. But uh, I, I just think we've got to just rethink not hurting the community. Because there are a lot of poor people, a lot of us retired. Um, it, we, but we can't go on and on trying to manage a checkbook with no income or of these great income deficits. And we cannot continue to reduce services for Orlando, the city of beautiful, when it's ugly. <laughs> I mean, what's beautiful about grass overgrown or you don't have any sod or you can't water this or you can't do that or you have very select areas and people don't understand that um, uh, a lot of neighborhoods help offset those expenses. So the neighborhoods who can't do this, they can't afford to see a reduction in services. We've got to pick up our trash. We've got to cut those mediums. We've got to get places boarded up or, or demolished or whatever we've got to do. So I think every time we talk about this, we uh, uh, go to the low-hanging fruit all the time. And nobody wants to look high, and that's millage increase um, by some portion, and I think we ought to come back with a formula that you just said. If we increase the dollar, it's 17 million. You go 50 cents, it's whatever half of 17 is. I can't figure that one out just yet. I've got to get my calculator. <laughs> but the point is, we've got to do something outside of our comfort zone at this time. It just makes sense, and I know some people may not like that, but I'd rather see us operating fully doing what we've got to do. Uh, I don't want to, uh, I don't have a problem with the grants. I've known about grants all my life, my adult educated life. But um, 
And they're giving us a lot of money for OPD <laughs> and fire. And we've got to be able to pay our people, and we've got to maintain a city staff of our firefighters, our workers, our OPD, everybody. But we've got to have a break here. And my recommendation, Mayor and Council, you just got to consider, you've got to consider a millage increase, in my opinion. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ames. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Rebecca, for your presentation. And I really do appreciate your graphics. Uh, that's a little different this time, but it looked great. Which brings me to uh, my first point on page seven, dealing with that uh, fiscal year 2015 budget challenge. Um, prior year unspent <coughs> revenues. Um, there's not even a drop in that bucket. I mean, no, sir. not even a little blue not showing. Even, not even a little mist of moisture. <laughs> Nothing. No mildew doing anything. And then uh, my second point is on page 24 uh, in regard to the uh, OUC revenue yeah. that has not kept pace with the CPI. Mm -hmm. um, what conversations that have been had with OUC discussing this? Because we see that we go back to 2007 to the present of 2014, and we've always obviously maintain a shortage there. So what conversations have taken place with OUC and where are we now with that? There's been a, a kind of a, a ongoing conversation every year with regard to this, um, this item. Uh, we've had a lot of downward pressure uh, from OUC. Uh, they have gotten admonished uh, by rating agencies that, you know, this is a big number for them. Uh, to be to be paying out it's not something that you see at necessarily at this level in some utilities however the the ownership situation of this utility is somewhat different than those and so as a result I think it, it there are reasons for it to be different there have also been in this period reductions in in uh, utility rates which has had a downward pressure on this as well uh, and I know that uh, a couple of years uh, in 2013 and 14, I believe, they sent over a lower number and we refused to have that go lower than what had been in the prior years. So um, we have, have done what we could, but I think it's a topic of conversation that needs to happen because it is a large portion of our budget. Uh, as I understand the history, uh, and others perhaps might be more uh, knowledgeable of this than I, uh, but as I understand the history, that, that part of the reason for purchasing OUC years and years ago was to provide a higher level of service for the citizens of Orlando through, uh, through this relationship. So I think that, that you know, there is certainly a conversation that needs to be had, and I would suggest um, just from from my seat that you know we look at some type of formulaic approach here that will keep us at least even with inflation with regard to that that revenue stream I, I know it would probably be difficult to go back several years with OUC uh, anticipating what should have been the contributions um, but I guess the real key is how do we move forward with the conversations that we're having now that it would have a great impact on what we're trying to accomplish? Right. I think one of the most important things for the, the, the council to consider as we drive toward a solution is that given where we are, our solutions need to be recurring. Uh, a clawback uh, to OUC would obviously provide us with some one-time money but it's much more important for us to get this back on track and if, to get it adjusted uh, to, to where we're, we're back, uh, where we need to be on that. Okay. Um, as we talk about our budget year, how does the fiscal year 2015 uh, budget affect our employee raises? Uh, because we haven't talked about that or considered that as any different expenses 
uh, for our budget. So what kind of impact are we looking at here? <clears throat> well, we, uh, when we put together uh, kind of the, the preliminary talking numbers, okay. use that term, not talking points, but talking numbers. Mm -hmm. When we put those numbers together, we put in all of the commitments that we have. Okay. So when we look at expenses, if we have a contract for salary increases, we will, inc we will put those increases into the number because we consider that part of that non-discretionary bar that I talked about. Right. It's, it's already there. It's something that we're committed to do. So um, those uh, things would be, would be in the number, and we would be working to fund all of our obligations as we have indicated them, or we would be reducing our obligations through actions that the city council would take on reducing services. Okay. I noticed we kind of talked a little bit about a possible anticipated gap, but do we have any idea what that anticipated gap is for our 2015 budget year? What are um, we looking at now? Once again, you know, we don't have all of the information, and if I were to, if I were to give you a number, it would probably be wrong. Okay. Uh, and, and once, once I get a tax roll, I would anticipate that we're going to get some good news from our tax roll. Okay, uh, we've looked at expenses. Uh, we probably will have some, uh, perhaps, good news on on the uh, anticipated sales tax front, for instance. And we get those numbers from the state usually in the June time frame. Uh, so I would hesitate to say that, but I do know that if we go back to our the picture of our bucket. Mm -hmm. That bucket was full last year, right. and we used it. Okay. And so we at least have a hole the size of that bucket. We know that. So I think that, that you know, that's uh, focusing on just the, the various different things and understanding what the impacts of all of the various actions we can take is something that will be useful and something that will help us to be prepared once those numbers are available to us and we can zero in on an amount. Okay. I do know this. I think it's a large amount. It's not a small amount. It's not something that we can just, that, that, that something will hit us and we can just heave a sigh of relief and move on. I, I don't think any, any manna is going to fall from heaven here. Uh, so as a result, I think it's going to be a large number that we're going to be working with. And I think it's going to take more than one solution. I don't think it's a, a single solution. I think there, there'll be more than one solution to solve the problem. Uh, and so as a result, getting educated and, and giving you up-to-date information about all of the alternatives you have, I think, is our next step in the process. Well, with that said, does raising the mill $1 uh, bring us close to this anticipated gap? <laughs> um, Raising it a dollar on last year's tax roll produces $17 million. Right. I do not know what it produces on this year's tax roll. Okay? okay. So that, therein lies my problem. I can't, I can't help you at this particular point because I don't know what all of my budgets are coming in from departments yet because they're still working on them. And we need to see that come in first. And, and we may have... Um, Pleasant surprises and unpleasant surprises coming through uh, the budget uh, submission process, which happen every year. That's nothing uh, abnormal. But we need to—I need time. And, and keep in mind that we're—we've come to you early. We've come to you long before we had the information to make that available. Mm -hmm. um, but we believe that we need this time to investigate the situation to inform you about it and then to look at all the alternatives that would be available to you and then we'll fit a solution once we have that number and and part of that investigation obviously is involving all of our departments uh, have you sent them any trim notice as using the word trim and cutting back or trying to reduce um, whatever services that they're providing where can they cut to, to actually save, are, are we having departments to look at that as well? N not at this time, because because we haven't gotten to that point where I have the direction from uh, the mayor and the city council to go in that direction. Uh, that's what the next few weeks are going to be about: is okay. determining if we want to go down the 
uh, the, the uh, reduction of services route. Uh, I will say that when I look at the magnitude of cuts that have been made over the last six years, I don't think that there are non-service level cuts of any magnitude to be made. I think that anything that we do going forward will have service level impacts. And so I think your, your question there really has to sort of be in the, on, on the landscape of service reductions. So if, if there are things that you know, they may want to offer up as a potential service reduction, then we'll, there'll be a point in time in which that's, that will happen. Okay. Well, again, thank you for your presentation, and thank you for wearing green. Uh, it kind of makes me feel optimistic because green is money, right? Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we'll move on to Commissioner Sheehan. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And Commissioner Lanham, you and I were here on September 9th, 2001, two, day, two days before September 11th when we reduced that millage rate, and uh, we had a huge economic downturn after that, of course, and then we had a recession in 2009 and we haven't raised it since. So that's how long it's been since the cut and no raising of the millage rate. Um, the gas tax now you see just aren't, aren't there because the, the people have been putting in energy efficiencies, which makes sense. We want them to do that. We want them to drive more energy efficient vehicles. I certainly do, but that has an impact to those revenues. Same thing with OUC, as people are, are putting in more energy efficient air conditioners, we're encouraging them to, um, you know, to insulate their homes. Revenues are going down. So again, that's part, that's part of that double-edged sword of efficiency. Um, I think we have to look to, to increasing the millage, even though people don't like to hear that. Um, we haven't done it in a long time. And I've said it before, I think we needed to raise it earlier, but we didn't have the, the uh, you know, the wherewithal to do it either. Um, but. I just like to say that we also cannot keep putting off services. I mean, I, I, my district is so full of potholes, people can barely drive through it anymore. It's getting ridiculous, and we have got to start fixing some of these roads, and got to, we have got to start putting some of these services back because, I mean, it's really getting ridiculous. And if anybody wants to take a ride with me, I'll be glad to show them how bad the streets are in my district. We have got to start providing this level of service that people expect. And, um, you know, we can't keep putting it off. And maintenance and things like that that we put off, what happens is it ends up costing more to fix things when you put off maintenance. So, I, you know, I certainly, you know, nobody likes to, to look at, at, um, at, it, at making increases, but I think that by do, in, in supporting that, I also ask that we make sure that we're providing those services back to our residents that they so desperately need because they are not being heard. And, you know, I can't just sit up here and say, you know, okay, I'm going to vote for an increase, but I'm not going to be, get any services from my district. I just don't think that's appropriate. So that's so all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, that was uh, some good initial discussion, Rebecca, I think. So for the last six years, we've gone into the budget process with a hole to fill. So our goal would be to come out of this process so that we set ourselves on a course that year in, year out, Revenues would hopefully grow as much as expenses would so that we wouldn't have a great surplus, but we'd at least come into a situation where we're not looking at double-digit million-dollar deficits going into the process. So that ought to be our goal for the next couple months. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, that concludes our workshop for today. Okay, Commissioner Ortiz, you are first up today. Hang on.
Commissioner Stewart. I uh, need to see FJ quickly afterwards, if you don't mind. And other than that, I'm okay. Commissioner Sheehan. I have nothing. Thank you. Commissioner Lynham. Nothing. Commissioner Ains. Yes, Mayor, I do. Okay. I do. I really do. Hey, under item H1, the H H H1, the 2014 Burn Criminal Justice Innovation Program grant. Uh, this is a grant that target neighborhoods with hot spots. I mean, which is just truly good. But I, the question that I have, and I do support this effort, but the question that I have is how much can you apply for in this grant? Because uh, I, I didn't see any figures, so if you can help me out with that. Chief, you want to touch base with him? Yes, because we're just in the um, application process right now, and the grant will help us um, uh, in conjunction with UCF target hot spots and once they determine what the hotspots are, where they are, what what the needs of the community are, I think then then is when they'll see what what resources uh, they can actually give us. Okay. But it's for uh, over time and development of programs to help with specific areas. And they're they're looking at um, narrow like uh, developments, like you know, one or two blocks, just so they can really target a specific area. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Rings? No, sir. Um, on the for information only, number two, Mayor, the uh, Greater Orlando Aviation Authority, February 19th meeting minutes. Um, that should be moved to today's consent agenda, uh, probably under a new item of J3, approving specific action items from February 19th, 2014 meeting of the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority because there are several items requiring approval or concurrence. Commissioner, or that's just accepting the minutes. If you look under J, like J2, right? that's the specific items from that March 19th meeting minute. We've probably already taken up anything that was off the 5th or the 19th and approved those. So we put those under other the, the specific items that have to be approved by council. Well, see, and that's the problem I have in trying to figure that out, you know, because it shows up in the for information only, but it talks of these approvals, and the same um, the same goes for uh, the capital expenditure funds, not to exceed say five million dollars from that uh, same meeting. So, and I see under J two the March 19th meeting, but I'm referring to the February 19th meeting. Yeah, I'm not sure why the meeting minutes for the two February meetings are showing up here, and we've already got the action items for the 19th, but I'll take a look at that. Okay, and then a number four for information only. The meeting minutes of the Risk Management Committee for February 25th a motion was made to approve the renewal of the Amway Center heliport liability policy, uh, annual premium of $3,025. And my question is, should we approve or accept their actions? And if so, then this should be moved under B6 for business and financial services also. Okay, I'll take a look at that one in the interim. And then my last, Mayor, is for information only number five. Uh, regular meeting minutes of November 14, 2013, of the audit board meeting. Uh, shouldn't public comments be at the beginning of a meeting and not at the end of the meeting? Because that's what they discussed in their minutes. And if they should be at the beginning, then these meeting minutes need to be corrected. I don't know the answer to that one. Okay. I think Kyle could probably help us with that one. We'll look into it. Thank you, Mayor. All right, Commissioner. Commissioner Gray? Yes, sir. I have to declare conflict on item C1. Uh, there's two items on the appearance review board, and I have a conflict on the first one. A business partner is one of the sponsors of that, so I need to abstain from C1. Okay, I think we can actually separate out the two items if you'll just notify okay. the clerk what the two are. Absolutely. And then also at the end, if I could see Brooke and Thomas Chapman, please. Okay, we're adjourned.